Good morning, River Church. How are you guys doing today? I'm Billy. Uh, I have a beard now. I haven't seen you guys in a long time. I'm excited to be here. Um, I, uh, I think the last time that I was online, uh, that I was able to spend some time with you guys at home, uh, was before uh, my season started, before my football season started. And, uh, you know, it's been crazy, as you guys, you probably haven't seen me with a beard this long, <laughs> but it's it's cool. Um, it's cool. Uh, welcome to 2021. Uh, we made it. Awesome. Um, I hope that this year is good for you. Last year was a blessing, and this year, uh, I believe, is going to be, um, it's going to be good. It's going to be good. So, uh <clears throat> With that said, I want, I want to get into today's sermon, and the title of today's sermon is A Call to Holiness, and, and I want to start with this, this story, and I, I want to, 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 to start with these observations, or, or this description, I want you to see, I want to see if you can guess where I'm trying to go with this, okay? Um, <clears throat> so, there is tension uh, in the air, right? In, in the nation, there is tension, right? People are tired. Uh, and they seem to be on edge. Uh, one group of people will say one thing, they'll believe one thing, while a different group of people will say something else, completely different, right? They're, they're on edge, uh, they're against each other. Uh, most people look at the situation on either side of the party, they look at the situation, uh, and they think, you know what? Things would be better if they could just go back to the way that they used to be. If they could just rewind the clock, Maybe a year or two, uh, things would be much better, right? Or, or, or maybe, maybe man, man, how much longer are we going to be in this situation? How much longer are we going to continue uh, to, to be here, to be doing this? And, and I want to ask you, does that sound familiar? The, the group of, the, the, the situation, the group of people, the, the, the scenario that I'm describing uh, is the Israelites. Uh, the Israelites in the wilderness after they had fled Egypt uh, in their, on their way to the promised land uh, during their time of wandering through the desert. Uh, it's really interesting. And, and I brought up this story for two reasons. The first reason is, obviously, it just sounds like what we're going through as a nation, right? Uh, we got people, one group of people saying one thing, uh, another group of people saying another, uh, something totally different, right? Uh, in, in their situation, they did not believe Moses. They didn't like Moses. Some people didn't. Um, they, didn't they, they, they were grumbling against Moses. We see that today. Uh, as, as some people in our nation uh, have that attitude towards our leaders. Um, and, and so there's a lot of parallels there. But the main reason uh, why I chose this passage is because that in the middle or, or, or during their wandering, God tells the Israelites something that I believe we could take with us into the new year. Okay, as, 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 as God told the, the Israelites this as they were going into the promised land, I believe we could have that same thing, uh, hear that same word to us going into this, this new year. Now, now before I, I tell you what he told the Israelites, I, I want to give us a little bit of a, a background, a little bit of a background of the Israelites and who the Israelites are. <clears throat> In Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through, th one through 3, God makes a promise with Abraham. And it reads, Now the Lord said to Abram, which later he changed his name to Abraham, He said, Go from your country and your kindred, excuse me, and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth 
shall be blessed. So God makes a promise to Abraham, and, and though it's not easy, right? Uh, I, Abraham is not the ideal candidate, right? Uh, uh, but but God 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 fulfills this promise, right? Abraham has a has a son, and old while he's old in age, right? Uh, his son's name is Isaac. Right, <clears throat> Isaac's son. Uh, he has two kids, uh, but but one of his sons, his name is Jacob. Right, and, and as we know, Jacob, uh, the Lord changes Jacob's name to Israel. Right, and, and so 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 Israel or Jacob has has twelve sons, Israel, and and those twelve sons become the nation. Of Israel, right? The twelve tribes of Israel, the nation. Okay, so Israel, Jacob, is Abraham's grandson, uh, and then and then through Jacob, the twelve tribes uh, are born, and then the nation of Israel becomes an actual group of people. It's more distinct. It's really fascinating stuff. Really fascinating stuff. Um, I, I I think it's 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 awesome. And so, um, during this time, the Israelites end up in Egypt, right? As you see at the end, end of Genesis, all the Israelites end up in Egypt, right, to, to survive a, a famine. They end up in Egypt, uh, they live there, uh, they spend a lot of time there. They're actually there for 400 years. <clears throat> and then after this 400 years, uh, the, the leadership, the pharaohs in, in, in Egypt, they, they forget, uh, they forget about the nation of Israel, and so Joseph brought him into uh, into Egypt, and and Pharaoh forgot about who Joseph was from 400 years ago, and he sees all these these Israelites, right, this huge nation that they had become, this huge huge group of people that they had become, and he's fearful of them, and so that's when Moses comes into the scene, <clears throat> and then that is when Moses t uh, tells Pharaoh to let his people go. And he, he pulls the people out of uh, bondage, out of slavery, uh, where well, the Lord leads them through in the ten plagues. And they, 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 they flee Egypt, and they split the Red Sea, and he goes through, and the Lord delivers them from Egypt. Super, super interesting stuff. Um, and, but, but this is all recorded uh, in the first, first five books of the Bible, right? So Genesis talks about the, the, the origins, the beginning, right? And then Exodus is a story that I just talked about where they're exiting out of, um, of Egypt. Uh, but the first five books really record the beginning, the, 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 uh, the start of the nation of Israel. So, so during this time in the wilderness, uh, on their way to the promised land, God tells them something. He tells them something that I believe that we could take, we should take with us into 2021. As this year has begun already, I believe that we could take this principle right into uh, 2021 with us. And that, that sentence, that phrase that he says is found in Leviticus. Now, if anyone's read Leviticus, I was actually talking to someone about this recently, and I and I believe this, I, I I feel this way at times myself. Is Leviticus Leviticus can be a very hard book to read. It's it's not the easiest book to read. There's a lot of sacrifices, a lot of laws, a lot of rules, a lot of guidelines in uh, in Leviticus, and it can be very very uh, difficult to read. But but but. To the Israelites, this book, Leviticus, was one of the most important books uh, that they had, right? Uh, the Israelites, at the beginning, uh, during during Moses' time, they had the Pentateuch. They had Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And these books were of the utmost importance to this early nation of Israel, okay? And especially Leviticus, right? Leviticus... Uh, uh, shows us how holy God is, right? God is so holy, he is so perfect, and Leviticus Leviticus <clears throat> really flushes this out, really paints this picture of the holiness of 
God, right? And so in Leviticus, there are uh, different sacrifices for different sorts of things. Uh, if you're unclean, if you, if you get some sort of disease, if something happens, uh, Leviticus really instructs the Israelites on how to, uh, to make themselves right or atone for their sins or make themselves clean again uh, when standing before a holy God. And so Leviticus, man, like, it can, it can be, and I've said this before, I just said this, it can be difficult for us to read at times, but, but, for the Israelites, man, this was, man, they had to know this stuff. Like, this was of the utmost importance. So the Israelites are wandering uh, through the desert, and so they would, uh, they were, they were wandering, they had not, they had not had a, 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 a nation, a land for themselves, and so they would wander, and so they would camp, and then they would wander, and then they would camp there, and they would set up the tabernacle, and then they would tear down, they'd wander somewhere else, and camp there, set up the tabernacle, and they would go to Mount Sinai, camp at the, the base of Mount Sinai, set up the tabernacle, the whole deal, they would do this, right? But, but while they were doing this, and uh, the Lord says something to them, okay? And this is found in Leviticus chapter 19, verses 1 and two, and it reads this. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel, and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. This is what I believe we should take with us into this year. I believe that every Christian should strive for personal holiness in 2021. In doing so, I believe that you'll see a development, uh, an improvement in your relationships with your family, uh, with your friends, and even with yourself. I also believe uh, that you will be at peace knowing that your integrity is intact okay uh, and I also believe that if we do this you will be uh, on mission with who Christ has called us to be <clears throat> now before we move on let's be clear uh, let, let me be clear uh, my charge to us this morning is for us to pursue holiness okay or, or being holy now what I want to point out is there there are, there are two positions or two ways to look at the word holy, right? The first way is positionally. So positionally, how do we stand positionally uh, in terms of holiness before God, right? Uh, positionally. And the second way is practically. Not so much positionally before God. Am I holy or am I not holy, uh, right? That's positionally, but practically, like, how am I? How is my behavior? How am I? Uh, <coughs> excuse me. How am I doing uh, as far as acting out in holiness? And so we're going to talk about these two different uh, ways. Okay, positionally before God, practically is is our horizontal uh, loving people acting out in what we believe. Okay. I have four points, four, four key points for us this morning. All right, the first three, they deal with this positional holiness. So where do we stand in position to God? And then the last point is us practically. Our practical holiness, meaning our actions outward. So a question, a question you might have right now is, what does holy even mean? Well, let's look at the perfect example. And this is our first key point, our, our point number one. This is, again, this is positional. And our first point is that God is holy. God is perfect. He is absolutely perfect. There is no change in Him. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Ever. He is the same. I was thinking about this recently. and says there's no change in him. There's no shadow uh, due to change. And 
man shadows shadows come from uh, erosion come from time come from being worn right it's not the same thing right i got shadows on my face because my face isn't the same but you guys get it, right? You, you get it. God is perfect, right? James 1.17 says, Every good gift and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. It does not change. His ways are perfect and good. Psalm 18.30 says, This God, His way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true, right? Uh, uh, he is a shield for all those who take refuge in him. His way, again, his way is perfect. Deuteronomy 32, verses 3 and 4 says, For I will proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God, the rock. His work is perfect. All his ways are justice. All his ways are just. All his ways are right. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright. See, he is perfect. There is no shadow due to erosion in him, right? There is no error. There is no flaw in him. He is absolutely perfect. <clears throat> last week in our Sunday school class, last Sunday, uh, we were actually pre uh, preaching. We were talking about uh, this subject of God's holiness and it was really interesting so I was trying to talk to this huge idea of God's holiness to you know five six year old kids right um, and uh, it was it was it was interesting it was fun uh, but to help illustrate this point right I had them go up to the whiteboard and I had them to take turns drawing circles right see who could draw the best circles I called each one up and I told them each to draw a circle and so they would go up, they'd grab the marker, take their time, they would look at maybe some of the other circles or look around the room to see if they could find a circle, and they wanted to make the perfect circle, right? Um, <clears throat> once they were done, they all voted to see which one was the best circle, and then they chose one. Uh, but in all, honestly, all, in all honesty, most of the circles looked like eggs, right? They were ovals, they were not round. Bless their hearts. I love those kids. Uh, but it's hard to draw a circle, right? So I was like, okay, circle's hard. Let's do a square, right? And so I call Austin <clears throat> up to the board, and, you know, all the other kids had had their turn at the square, and they, you know, took their time, and Williams actually looked like an arrowhead. It wasn't so much a square, but it was more of like something you would see at the end of a bow and arrow, right? An arrow. Um, <clears throat> but, but one of the boys, Austin, he had an interesting interesting strategy so he goes up to the whiteboard and he gets a marker and what he does is he he starts to draw out the four uh, different corners right per 90 degree angles right the different corners he sets those corners and then he decides to draw the lines to uh connecting the, the corners together i was like man, that's a great strategy um i was like good job seven-year-old child you did great um, and it was good, it was good, but as we saw, the, the square was not perfect. Now, is God worried about how well we can draw squares, right? Am I saying that God is the perfect square drawer? Well, yes, he is, but that's not my point. Uh, but just as, as those, those, uh, and I told the kids, if God was was drawing the, the square, drawing the circle, they would be absolutely perfect squares, absolutely perfect circles. And I said, God isn't so much worried about our, our shape drawing ability, uh, but this perfectness is 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 desired is what He wants to see in our in our character, in our in our in our. Uh, in our moral, uh, spiritual, uh, he wants to see from us in that way. So, so Leviticus, what we're talking about, right? God says, uh, uh, be holy for I am holy. Leviticus is about the holiness of God and the way that the Israelites were to act, um, to even be able to approach 
this holy and perfect God. Right? Which leads me to my second point. Right? Though God is perfect, we are not. Right? My key point number two is we are not holy. And again, this is a positional statement uh, in reference to holiness. We are not holy. Right? God is holy. God is perfect. We are not. <clears throat> we are not holy. Right now, I want you to, to rate your holiness. What do you think your holiness is? In your head, right? Where would you rank yourself? Or place yourself on a scale uh, of unholiness. You can give that a zero. Uh, to perfect holiness, a ten. Right? Uh, where would you rate yourself in that scale? <clears throat> right? Uh, the, the unholiness, the, 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 the zero would be the Ill, Ill, illegible square. Right? The oval looking circle. Right? Ten would be absolutely perfect, right? The perfect square. I'll give you 10 seconds to do that. Where would you rank yourself? Ready? Go. Hmm. Um, if you're honest, if I'm honest, we probably gave ourselves like a 7 maybe an eight, we're not perfect, but we're, we're not that bad, right, I'm a, I'm a seven, I'm an eight, right, uh, you know, if you're like, man, you know, I'm, if we're extremely modest, we're probably giving ourselves like a five or a four, like, man, I'm, I'm not very good, but my point is, is we tend not to think of ourselves how we actually are, or let me rephrase that, we tend to think that we are better than what we actually are. But the truth is, we are not holy at all. We are at the zero. Right? Imagine the zero is tilted over and it's a hole and we are falling through that hole and we are not coming back up out of that zero. Right? We are not holy at all. Absolute zero. There used to be this show on TV. It was really interesting. It was called Pros vs. Joes. You may have seen it. Um, but they had all these, you know, former professional athletes play these non-professional average Joes, right? Pros versus Joes. So the show would set up this average Joe who actually thought he can compete with a professional athlete. And so for basketball, they would get a professional basketball player. And he was usually retired at this point, so he wasn't even in his prime. Uh, but he would play a person who, uh, against a person who auditioned for the show. Now, most of these players had uh, maybe high school experience, but as, as the show began, it was really interesting. They'd show the person in the locker room, and, you know, he'd be, like, lacing up his sneakers, and he'd be, like, stretching and, like, putting on his Ben Gay or whatever else he would put on, and he would, like, his headband, and he would be getting all excited and, like, ready to go. And uh, <laughs> I was like, man, maybe this guy's going to do it. Like, I wonder if that's the guy that I want to be like, right? <clears throat> And, uh, but they would show him getting ready, they would show him lacing up sneakers, right? And then, and then he'd be off to the arena. And then the co competition would, be, would begin, right? And almost instantly, the professional would easily dominate and defeat the average Joe. Especially if this retired athlete, professional athlete, was actually trying. Sometimes they just, okay, whatever, I guess I'll do this. Or I guess I'll play, I guess I'll be a part of this. But they were actually trying, it wasn't even a competition. Right, the professional athlete would easily dominate this average Joe. It didn't take long in this situation. It didn't take long for us to quickly realize that this average Joe, this person, didn't even belong in the same court as the professional athlete. We see a similar picture in Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter six, verses one through five. It reads this, it says, In the year King Uzziah died, I, Isaiah, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne. So he saw the Lord, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, I'm sorry, the seraphim, right? 
each had six wings. So it was this flying creature. It had six wings. Uh, with two of the wings, he covered his eyes. With two of the wings, he covered his feet uh, or his face. With two of the wings, he covered his feet. And with the other two, the last two, he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Right, So they're talking to each other. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. <clears throat> and the house was filled with smoke. And I, Isaiah, and I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean, unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. That is me. That is us. We too should... Be, woe is me. Right? We tend to think that we are better than what we are. Standing face to face in front of a holy and perfect God, we should be saying, woe is me. I'm, I am not worthy to be here. I am lost. I am unclean. And I dwell in the midst of unclean people. We should feel really, really, really small against a perfect and holy God. We do not belong in the same room as God. That is why Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden. <coughs> Excuse me. That is why they're kicked out of the garden in Genesis 3 when, uh, when they sinned, right? An unholy, not, cannot cannot be around a holy God. That is why there were some extreme measures and sacrifices that the Israelites were to do to even be considered to come to be right before God. And this is what the book of Leviticus talks about. We, uh, we are not that. Right? Romans says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all fall short of God's perfect requirements, every single one of us. All right, we are not holy. This moves us on to our point number three. And again, this is positional. So where we stand positionally before God. And point number three is Christ makes us holy. So in Ephesians 2, 1 through 8, it says this, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Even when we were um, alive together with Christ, by, the, by grace you have been saved and raised up with him, and seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and it is not of your own doing, it is a gift of God. Romans 3 3.23, verses 3.20, uh, Romans chapter 3, verses 23-25 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood. He made us right by His blood. But now, this is, Another verse, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 13 says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off, have been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. So this 
the system of sacrifice that we see in Leviticus, right, was in place to, to, uh, to prepare the Israelites, the nation of Israel, people who are in pursuit of God, to prepare them for this, this sacrifice of Jesus' blood. He is the final sacrifice, the once and for all sacrifice. His perfect blood shed for us is what, is what allows us to be made right positionally before God. In Jesus, in Jesus, we are perfect. We are that perfect ten. If you believe that, then praise God. You're a child of the living God, holy before Him. If you don't believe that, then I would encourage you this morning to put your faith in Jesus. There is nothing of greater importance than to put your faith in Him. Which leads us to our last point. As, 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 as you have come to a new identity in Jesus, you have been set apart. You have been made new. You have been called to be holy. Again, this brings us to our last point, point number four. Uh, we are called to be a holy people. Now again, the first three were positionally how we stand before God. This one is us practically, practical holiness. This is what it would look like for us going out. <clears throat> we are called to be a holy people. Right, 1 Peter 2, 9 says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Much like the nation of Israel, Christian, we are a Christian nation, a holy nation, a people for His own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. <clears throat> he calls us as, as individuals to be part of the body of Christ or as Peter describes a holy nation much like the Israelites a nation set apart to make his name known to the world we are a chosen people to make much of Jesus in our daily lives we are like the we are the fulfillment or or what we see in God's promise to Abraham. It says, And I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all of the families of the earth shall be blessed. Christ has done that through his sacrifice on the cross, and we are called to be this holy nation, to make much of Jesus, to proclaim His excellencies to the world. Conclusion. So the last thing, we're going to be closing now. And, and I want to remind us, as we close today, I want to reiterate what I stated at the beginning of the service. I believe that we should all strive for personal holiness in 2021. Right. Positionally, <clears throat> we are uh, under Jesus' blood. Right, We are in Christ. We are holy before the Lord in Christ. But I, 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 I pray that we strive towards this, this, this personal or practical holiness in 2021. Like me, you might be overwhelmed, might be thinking about all the different ways that you can make this happen and not know where to begin. And if you have something in mind that the Lord has been convicting you of, some place where you're not really meeting the mark, let that be your action step. Let that be how <coughs> excuse me, how you decide to walk in holiness. But if there's not, here's what I want you to focus on for this week. This is our action step. This is the, the thing that I want us to, to focus on this week. And, and and my, my application point or my action point is to, to be truthful. 
It is found in our passage today in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 11. It's right after God tells his people to be holy. Right, right after he tells them that, he says, uh, You shall not deal falsely uh, with, with other people. You shall not lie to one another. This is what I want us to, our focus to be. Right, again, as we go through uh, this year, uh, on Sundays, hopefully, Lord willing, <laughs> we try at our best, but uh, we, we, we talk about what, 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 what acting out our faith looks like from a practical sense. And so this will continue to grow. This, this, will, this will continue to develop throughout the year. But today, we'll just focus on one small change, right? One small change. One small step, and, and and again, that step was to <clears throat> to be truthful, right? Uh, you shall not deal falsely with one another. In its simplest version, it would be to tell the truth. Now, this doesn't mean to go and tell everybody, like, hey, I don't like your shirt. Hey, you probably shouldn't eat that donut, right? That's not what this means. <clears throat> but I am talking about uh, what I am talking about is in our situations where we want to to lie or we want to make ourselves look better. And again, this is in its simplest form. It means to tell the truth. And for some of us, that's all we need, right? Some of us are those habitual liars, right? Yeah, man, I went fishing and, you know, I caught ten fish. It's like, bro, I was there. You caught like two fish and they were not keepers, right? Um, but But you are... A, uh, you may be a habitual liar and you just lie, right? I think there's a study, they said that 60% of people lie uh, during a 10-minute conversation and they'll lie with about two to three uh, lies on average. And so maybe that's you. Maybe you're just someone who wants to look better, right? Uh, I know I struggle with this <coughs> at times. Um, but maybe that's you. Maybe that's you. So, be truthful. Be truthful. <clears throat> Deeper than that, though, is keep your word. If you say you're going to do something, follow through with it. Uh, I'm like the opposite of Amazon, right? I, I What I tend to do, or what Amazon does, is they under-promise and then they over-deliver, right? This package will get here in like two to four weeks, and it's there like in three days. Like, oh my gosh, Amazon, you're awesome. But what I tend to do is like, hey man, I'll be there in two or three days, and I take like two weeks, right? <clears throat> but, but, but follow through with what you say you're going to do, right? Uh, I have... <clears throat> Uh, really taking this to heart with my with my kids, right? When I tell my kids something, it's so easy to say something and then not want to follow through with it. It's so easy to say something, say, "Hey, we're gonna go get ice cream today," and we don't go get ice cream. It's easy for me to to tell my children, "Hey, I'm gonna go lay down with you tonight. Go go go, put you guys down for bed tonight," and then not be able to do it. Uh, but I want my kids. I want my kids to know that when their dad tells them something, that their daddy means that, that they can count on that to happen. So keep your word. And some of us being truthful might be uh, with you know with with our conversations with our wife. Maybe it's maybe it's finances. Maybe we we kind of bend the truth here and there just so we don't get into a big fight over finances. Right. Uh, for others, it might be at at your workplace environment. Maybe we're we're holding the truth a little bit. We're bending the truth with our coworkers. Maybe with the people who are our our, our bosses. Uh, we are bending the truth so we don't get in that much trouble. So we can maybe pass the blame to someone else uh, to make it look like it is not our fault. But whatever it is, let us be a truthful people. In doing so, as I said, in doing so, you'll see a development in your relationships with your family, with your friends, and with yourself. And I believe 
that you will be happy that you are your integrity is intact and i also believe that you will be on mission with who christ has called you to be guys uh, i love you guys um that wraps up our sermon for today um i am excited to be here uh what I, I want to say, we, we are getting our, our gospel communities cranking here pretty soon. So get those if you haven't registered for that. Uh, man, uh, I'm excited about it. We're starting, I know I'm starting mine uh, in two weeks, uh, in two Wednesdays. So I think it's like a week and a half by the time uh, from Sunday. So, <clears throat> but uh, get, get to one of those. We have uh, in-person meetings. We also have virtual GC to go through Zoom so whatever you feel comfortable with, sign up for a GC. Right today we talked about personal holiness. We talked about walking, right? God tells us to be holy because He is holy. And so today we talked a little bit about what that looks like in our gospel communities. We go a little bit further. We really challenge each other and push each other towards walking uh, humbly with our God. Um, <clears throat> so that's the first thing I like to say. The second thing I like to say is um, our giving. Um, our church is supported by your good and generous gifts, and so <clears throat> uh, make your way on over to uh, our website, and, and you, it's easy to get through, and you can do your online giving, and again, uh, what we do is, is, is from your good and gracious gifts. Uh, guys, I love you. It has been fun to be here with you guys. Uh, I'm Hopefully, my beard wasn't too distracting today. Uh, I love you guys. And I will see you guys soon.